Awesome. So again, thank you all for joining the Osteopathic Medical School panel event today. Um, today we have three uh, representatives from three institutions. We have um, uh, Lyman Moer from MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine. We also have Jenna De Stefano from Rowan um, Osteopathic Medicine, and also Carrie Mortensen. Mortensen, I can't talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Midwestern um, Chicago College of Medicine. And so um, I am going to just go oh, ahead right. and hand it over um, to our panelists and um, allow them to present. They'll each, each school will present about 10 minutes on their institution. Um, if you have questions, please do put it in the chat, but all questions will be um, answered at the end of the three presentations. So we appreciate you all for being here and Carrie, it's all you. Hi, thank you everyone for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen. My colleagues can let me know that you see my screen. That would be great. I don't know, technical difficulties. Yes, we can see it. Uh, maybe press the presenting mode so we only see your uh, right at the bottom of the little. Where do I? Where is that at? So at the bottom of the slide, the little presenter. It's at the bottom on the right hand side. Yeah, that one. Maybe that will do it for you. Let's see. There it is. Yep. Perfect. So my name is Carrie Mortensen. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions. So I'm just going to take a few minutes um, to share a little bit about Midwestern. We cover a lot of different healthcare programs. So we, in our Office of Admissions, it's centralized. So we can talk to students with all different interests and backgrounds. And each program obviously has a different cast. There's different admission requirements. So we're happy to talk with students about that. Today, I'm going to talk with you about CCOM, Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine but just briefly kind of where we were and to where we are. So we were founded in 1900 downtown in the city of Chicago. We moved out to Downers Grove in the mid eighties. So the picture here, this is actually of the Glendale campus. The rest of the pictures are uh, Downers, but we do have two campuses. So we do have a campus in Glendale, Arizona and that opened up in the mid nineties. We do have over um, 6,800 active students and over 26,000 alum. What makes us unique, uh, and I'm sure you'll probably hear a lot of this too, as you talk to different programs, not just osteopathic, but also allopathic, because I think some of the philosophy that osteopaths have, you're also going to find that allopathic programs are, are incorporating that methodology as well. But we sp uh, specialize in interprofessional education at Midwestern. So I mentioned just a couple seconds ago that we have multiple healthcare programs. So our students, as they start their education in their program, will actually take classes with students from other healthcare disciplines. As they transition into their core curriculum, then they'll transition into their cohort of students. But early on, students in our medical school are learning with PAs, our pharmacy, our dental students, optometry students. They'll do case studies together um, to really have that understanding of what that collaborative environment and that healthcare team is all about. And then they move into their cohort of courses and rotations within their program. We're located just outside the city of Chicago, um, about, you know, it's a stone's throw, essentially. Um, you have easy access to public transportation. We are off major interstate and tollways to get to and from the city. And then we have the Metro, which is 10 minutes in downtown Downers. So easy access to and from the city. Midwestern focuses on teaching. So we, are hi we hire our faculty to teach our students to become the best clinicians that they can. They focus on research, but teaching is their number one priority. We have an open door policy, which means when they're on campus, they're not just teaching in the classroom. If they're in their office, they're there to help you. Um, faculty that do have research projects welcome students to participate with them. So they'll work close and collaboratively on those projects. And only faculty or adjunct faculty are teaching our students. So we do not have any graduate TAs that teach any of our courses. 
We're very service oriented. So as we are reviewing candidates, we like to see that they come from um, a history of service projects, community service, volunteering. We want our students to be able to continue to give back. And we do a lot with the city of Chicago and the surrounding suburbs. Our multi-specialty institute actually caters to a very diverse population of patients. And since we aren't just a tie to one specific hospital, our students are trained in all different types of clinics and hosp hospitals throughout the Chicago metropolitan area. So briefly with this, just gives you an overview of the, the program itself and osteopaths across the country. DOs are really becoming more abundant. So as you see here that 20% uh, of the workforce um, consists of the DO population and then 20% of medical, 25%, I'm sorry, of medical students today are actually looking into the DO programs out there. We're the fourth oldest college of osteopathic medicine in the country. Our class size, as you see, is eight to one student to faculty ratio. And we have an excellent match rate match rate when our students are placed in their residency programs. Just some general prerequisites. We require a bachelor's degree. You see that we have a minimum GPA requirement. That is just to be considered for the program. I do have another slide that gives you averages so you can see where you fall. Our prerequisite courses that you see listed there they're pretty general. So if you have specific courses that you're looking to fulfill some of these, we can discuss that. All of our prerequisites have to be completed with a grade of C or better. C minus is not accepted to complete prereqs. Students can major in anything that they want. So we have no preference in what their major is, just as long as they get these courses covered within their degree. We do require two letters of recommendation. One needs to be from a pre-health advisor or a science professor who's taught you. The other can be from anyone other than a family member or friend. We do prefer to see an, a medical or physician letter. It could be an MD or a DO that is not required. You can submit up to four letters. We will read all four, that's perfectly fine. We just have to have these two in order to complete the application. And then the MCAT is required. There is no minimum score. We just require that you take that MCAT no more than three years prior to matriculation. As you see here on this chart, I highlighted in yellow because we have all the other programs listed here as well. This was for the incoming class this past fall. So we had that minimum GPA of a 275, but as you can see with the overall science and GPAs, they're well above that. We do a holistic review of the application. So we are looking for, as I mentioned, service-oriented students. We are looking with students that have uh, healthcare background and experience. It does not have to be paid. Shadowing, volunteering, all of that is perfectly acceptable. We look for students that can balance their, their schedules. We want time management. We want students to be active, not only within their community, but within the university that they're attending. So are they involved in clubs and organizations? Do they have leadership skills? All of those will come into uh, play when we are reviewing your application. We don't have a preference if you're in or out of state. Um, as you can see, we look at students all across the country in all backgrounds. So it's not just students coming right out of undergrad as well. We have a lot of students, believe it or not, that do um, what we call the non-traditional or career change. So they look into uh, medicine. A little bit about our campus in Downers Grove. I mentioned we're outside the city of Chicago. It is um, a campus that has all the amenities that you would have at a larger institution, just scaled down. So we have housing on campus. It is not required. We have suite style residence halls. We have some on-campus apartments. Parking is free, which is a big deal. That includes our parking garage, which is excellent during the winter months. For those of you that, as you know what it's like in the winter, having that covered spot is essential. Our campus consists of multiple state-of-the-art labs. Our students are not just in one building for their education. They actually will, will spend time in many of the different simulation centers and lecture halls and buildings across campus. So this just gives you a little bit of sense of 
what our campus consists of with the different labs. I don't need to read all of those, but each building will hold a program's lab, but students from all different programs may be in that building. So again, we're still trying to build that team environment. So students are um, socializing and studying amongst other disciplines and not just their peers alone. We have a clinic. I mentioned the multi-specialty clinic. This is just about three miles just west of campus. We do not have this right on our clinic or our campus where we house all the lectures, labs, and sim centers. It is a separate campus. It has houses multiple specialties, as you can see here listed. Family medicine being one of them. Our students do not just see patients in this building. I mentioned earlier that our students, when they go on their required rotations, will have rotations throughout the Chicago metropolitan area. We have some that are in you know, central Illinois. We have some that even go into southern Wisconsin and western Indiana as well. I'll be happy to answer your questions after the rest of the presentation. And I think, Lyman, are you going next? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll pull up my slides here. And I'll share that. Can I get a thumbs up? You can see that. I got this set up correct. Yep, we're good. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and give a quick uh, sort of introduction to Michigan State and the College of Osteopathic Medicine. My name is Lyman Mower. I'm the Director of Admissions for the college. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit just to just kind of give you sort of a, a brief overview. Certainly, if there's other questions at the end, I'd be happy to, um, to address any of those. Go to our website as well to com.msu.edu. Um, you can find admissions information there too. There's a link to our calendar. So if you'd like to meet with me or somebody else from my office to discuss an upcoming application, if you're a little bit further out and you'd like to um, just get some information about how to be well prepared for a future cycle, we're happy to do that too. So I host um, our sort of drop-in hours that we do every Wednesday, but we have one-on-one -on -one appointments that we can schedule as well too. So don't be shy if there's questions that we can answer for you, um, we'd be happy to do so. And definitely do want to encourage you to apply. We are um, a legacy public medical school in the state of Michigan. Michigan, I think, often features as uh, part of an application strategy for a lot of students because we have seven medical schools total in the state. Um, I am the, the, the lone osteopathic representative. Um, so we have six allopathic and one osteopathic medical school in the state. Um, and I think the density of those opportunities is often appealing for people that are putting together um, an out-of-state strategy. So if you're from a state that doesn't have a lot of public medical schools or doesn't necessarily have an obvious choice, um, I think Michigan and sometimes other states too represent a good place to, um, to sort of put together an application plan tactically. Um, so we do have uh, the majority of our students coming from within the state of Michigan. We have a class every year that we matriculate of around 300, give or take. So usually that target class size for us is pretty much right on the nose there with 300. We will admit um, uh, a class this year that'll be about two thirds in state and one third out of state. And that's more or less our enrollment target going forward too. So we really do admit, um, even for a state school, like a very large percentage of our class and a very large total uh, body of students that are from uh, out of state as well too. So I think geographically, we have tremendous diversity and tremendous breadth in our class. And so um, really want to encourage people to apply to Michigan State because it's a big place with a lot of opportunity. But I also think that it just makes sense pragmatically as well, too, for a lot of out-of-state students. There's a lot of wonderful out-of-state students that um, you know, we're able to attract to Michigan. And so um, I always want to be encouraging on that front. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the averages academically. This is not a major consideration, I think, in a lot of cases. I share this information mostly because I get asked about it. Uh, our median science GPA tends to be between a 3.6 and a 3.7 um, pretty much every year. So again, a very, very solid performance overall. 
And our MCAT, the median MCAT for our entering class is usually around a 507 or a 508. So right around sort of the break point between the upper third and the middle third of test takers. But in a lot of ways, our admissions committee feels very, very motivated to um, move on from academic considerations into what they think of as far more interesting areas when they're really considering class composition, how someone may contribute to our educational community, how they may well align with osteopathic principles. And so it will be unsurprising to you that part of our pre-interview process and certainly part of our interview process is to understand ways in which you've led and engaged in your community and various communities that you're a part of. What you may know about osteopathic medicine as a distinct identity. We have more DOs in the state of Michigan than anywhere else in the world. So, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them are alumni of our institution. So we're very, very proud of that legacy of care, um, that focus on, um, on osteopathic principles and practice. And so we're looking for people that really want to be part of that legacy of the college as well, too. So we're looking for that broad alignment with who we are as an institution. And so service um, and leadership feature very, very prominently in that. I mentioned that we have a class of 300 that we matriculate. We start in um, early-ish July, right around um, July 8 will be our start of orientation this year. So you can anticipate in future years that that's about the time that we start. So we have a sort of a midsummer semester begin. Um, we have a class of 300. We distribute our pre-clerkship students among three different sites, as we call them. So they're not distinct campuses, it's just one college, but we have students in a few different locations throughout the state. So the majority of our students are in East Lansing. So about 200 of the 300 students will begin on the main MSU campus. The other third of the class is split between our two pre-clerkship sites uh, in Macomb, which is on the uh, Macomb Community College campus next to the Henry Ford Hospital and Detroit, which is um, in Midtown Detroit at the DMC. One of the real strengths of our pre clerkship setup here is that I think it allows students to have the opportunity to leverage both of the strengths of a very, very large institution, obviously with about 1,200 medical students across all four years. We're leveraging tremendous resources educationally and in terms of research opportunities for our students. But combining that possibility and all of those resources and advantages with the opportunity to, to be part of a smaller and maybe more intentional community if that's comfortable for students as well too. And so we often find that many students are attracted to Detroit or Macomb precisely because they feel a little bit intimidated maybe about being um, in an environment where you have 400 or so clerkship students across um, the first two years in East Lansing, as well as our PA students for that matter. We have a reasonably small PA cohort um, of 38 students. So, you know, it's a pretty bustling place in East Lansing. And so a lot of students, I think, um, respond really well to the opportunity to be part of a community that's a little bit more intimate um, at a place where, you know, essentially everybody will know your name, you'll know all of your colleagues in the first year and in the second year. So it's a really, really um, well-established community in those settings. So I think that that's a unique strength that we can offer in terms of giving students um, some opportunity to select um, a location geographically and also size-wise that they're comfortable with. I'd be happy to address questions about our curriculum, um, but I won't focus too much on it here. Um, just know that it's, um, I think, a fairly traditional approach to delivering medical education content. And I think that we've been um, practiced at integrating this across our three sites um, for about the last 15 years. We opened our two Southeast Michigan sites in 2009. So we've had an integrated approach to pre-clerkship education for a long time now. We have a lot of opportunities for students to get involved with service activities. If you go on our website, um, we actually have some introductory videos if you're interested in looking, um, looking at our student organizations and especially at our street medicine um, and outreach programs, which are a big draw for students as well too. Um, those are things I'd encourage you to check out if you're interested. Um, another big draw for students, and one of the reasons that people choose to come to MSU is the variety and the depth of our international health programs. We have opportunities across all four years of the curriculum for students to participate in multiple um, medical electives. Some are more clinically focused, some are more research focused. These opportunities begin in the spring of the first year. 
but um, we're the only medical college at Michigan State where students are actually able to do international rotations up to and including in their fourth year of medical school as well too. So there's a lot of flexibility in our curriculum to incorporate some of these uh, more service um, and, and global health related uh, initiatives. And we think that that aligns really nicely with our sense of identity as an osteopathic institution as well. Um, just to touch on student life, there's lots of ways to get involved with the college. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved with student organizations and activities. We have a robust student government. Um, our students um, tend to hold a lot of positions at the national level in the Student Osteopathic Medical Association. So there's lots of opportunities for leadership and participation and influence um, within the college and policy and practice at other levels as well. We have a lot of different services in the college to help support our students as well. We have um, a robust academic and career advising office that supports the professional growth and development of our students. They address everything from academic concerns early on to transitioning into career support as students move into um, their clerkship year and their hospitals and then beyond into the residency selection process from there. We have a wellness and counseling team as well um, that provides everything you'd expect in terms of wellness programming at the college, but they provide additional personal counseling resources for our students as well. And these are resources that we've added above and beyond what the university already provides. So we make sure our students, I think, are extremely well supported both academically and personally in terms of their total well being while they're students at the college. We have a lot of research opportunities. We have the largest and the oldest um, of the dual degree programs for physician scientist training in the United States. If you have any interest in just research generally, but certainly interest in pursuing a physician scientist pathway, please reach out. I'd love to put you in touch with the DOPHD program. I'd be happy to talk to you about the suitability um, of that pathway for you and how you combine your medical education with a doctoral program at Michigan State. Likewise, we have a dual degree that we offer in conjunction with the College of Business as well. And so we have an MBA program that we can offer as well. It's a five-year program to complete both of those. Um, and then I'll just touch very briefly. That's more or less the first half of medical school. Um, in terms of clerkship, we have a very, very large network of hospital partners throughout the state of Michigan. This is a more or less pretty thorough geographic representation of the distribution here. Uh, unsurprisingly, most of our hospitals are in Southeast Michigan, the most densely populated part of the state. Uh, but our base hospitals are part of what we call the statewide campus system, which in brief is just simply a collection of graduate medical education resources. So it's a collection of our residency, fellowship, internship programs. So this is the context in which our students train in the third and fourth years as they, uh, as they acquire more skills and as they acquire greater professionalization and they um, get ready to make that transition to the next level of training in their professional pathway. So the statewide campus system, I think, is a tremendous tool for students to leverage in terms of building um, uh, partnerships, building an understanding of what residency programs and residency directors are looking for in terms of residence selection. We have uh, a large number of base hospitals. We actually have 24 base hospital sites. And I think that that's a number that stays pretty consistent from year to year. Some of those sites have multiple hospitals. So depending upon where you look on our website, you may see different numbers of hospitals, but students will rank order their sites. And then we have a matching process that places students in as many top choices as we can give them. And then there's a trade period where students can also swap hospitals. Students have the opportunity to actually take two electives in their third year, which is kind of a nice thing. Not a lot of medical schools are able to offer as much flexibility in the third year. A lot of that tends to be pre-programmed with required rotations. Um, but there's some opportunity for our students to have some elective coursework in there as well. And then, of course, the fourth year of medical school is usually something that's planned in conjunction with um, the academic and career advising team and really helping students customize a pathway forward at that point. I'll touch on a few things about residency. Um, this is, uh, I don't have this year's match because obviously we'll find out more on Friday, but this is representative of what we see every year. So um, the overwhelming majority of our students, I think, are extremely successful. And generally speaking, I think when we see students who don't match, it's largely for more idiosyncratic or personal or sometimes even strategic related types of reasons. Um, we have a wide variety of outcomes, which is, I think, one of the greatest things that we can see. This gives you a sense from year to year of what we see in terms of distribution of specialties among our students. 
Um, and so it's probably a lot, of, a lot of things that you'd expect to see in terms of, um, you know, the variety of things that a, that a large graduating class is doing. But to break it down a little bit further for you, um, most years we'll have about half of our class graduate, go into some type of primary care area. So about half of our students are doing surgical or some other type of specialty areas. Um, generally speaking, about half of our class, a little bit less than half of our class, will match into one of our residency programs in the statewide campus system. So certainly it's a great landing place for students, but we get students in a lot of programs outside of our system as well. We'll have another quarter of our class match within state. Uh, and generally speaking, we have about a quarter of our class match out of state every year. Um, military students tend to be really successful in our process. They almost always match through the military, but we do have some go through the NRMP process. Um, and we are one of a smaller group of medical schools that does admit um, international students. And so most of those international students tend to be in a lot of ways, I think, functionally domestic students. They're students who have acquired their undergraduate and oftentimes a master's degree in the United States, um, but they do not have necessarily U.S. citizenship or permanent residence. Um, our international students every year are very, very successful as well, too, in terms of finding a residency match as well, too. So we're able to support those kinds of students as well. So that's um, that's the quick version of everything. Um, here's our contact information just really briefly, but you're able to find us on the web as well, too. So I'll stop there. All right. I think it's my turn. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jenna DeStefano. I am the recruiter and admissions advisor in the admissions department for Rowan Virtual Assam School of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm trying to, what can we screen here real quick? Okay, everybody can see we're good. All right, so yep. we are located. Okay, good. Thanks. So we're located in South Jersey. We are the only osteopathic medical school in New Jersey. Um, so just a little rundown of what we'll go over today. I usually use this um, presentation specifically for longer webinars. So I'm going to kind of skip through a couple of things that, um, you know, I feel most of you will probably already know just for time's sake, but uh, we'll go over Rowan Virtua, who we are, we'll probably skip through why go DO, because I'm sure uh, you all are very familiar with DO versus MD uh, by now. Rowan Virtua SOM, we will go into our two different curriculum tracks, SGL and PBL, uh, the Center for Student Success. Uh, we'll kind of dig a little deeper into our mission, the New Jersey Advantage, our campus advantage, and then we'll go over a little bit on early decisions. So just keeping it pretty high level today. So Rowan Virtua, um, so Rowan University, our undergrad um, is located in Glassboro. Rowan Virtua SOM, School of Osteopathic Medicine, we have two campuses located in Stratford and Sewell. They're about 20 minutes apart from each other. Um, Virtual Healthcare, that's the largest healthcare system in South Jersey. Um, so they just combined actually in 2023. Uh, so that was a huge um, merge for Rowan and Virtua. The goal of coming together was really just to make a large impact in medicine and education. Um, yeah, so a collaboration of unique strengths. And I'm going to move on from here. We're going to skip over why go DO. And now this is really kind of what we'll focus mainly on today. Just some fast facts of our school. All right, so... Um, Rowan Virtual School of Osteopathic Medicine. Let, so let's start with a, um, some facts about our medical school. So for one, our school, uh, school of Osteopathic Medicine graduates have a 99 to 100% residency match rate. Last year, it was 100%. Um, so they just go right from graduation into the residency. They usually have zero lag time. Uh, this gives our program an edge because according to the NRMP, which I'm sure you are all somewhat familiar with, on average, 89% of osteopathic medicine graduates go straight into their residency after graduation. So, you know, that's a great stat, uh, but we do have a little bit of an advantage with our rate being at that 99%. Um, so to add on to this, we, uh, like I stated before, we are New Jersey's only osteopathic medical school. Uh, we also have a 95 to 99% pass rate for the Comlex one through three. 
uh, which is the Comprehensive Osteopathic Medicine Licensure Exam, or our boards, um, that obviously our students would need to pass in order to graduate. So um, this just shows that our program, not only it's not only preparing future physicians for their healthcare career, but it's also preparing them to pass these very difficult exams along the way. Uh, Rowan also provides free student-run tutoring and uh, that is administered by upperclassmen, which is the center uh, for six student success. So we give a lot of our um, kudos to that center uh, for helping our students in tutoring and helping them really uh, do well in those exams. Uh, we are, uh, we're ranked nationally among osteopathic and allopathic medical schools by the U.S. News Report and uh, we are a Carnegie R2 institution and the third fastest growing public research university, which I'll get into a little bit more in a couple more slides. Uh, we have a huge commitment to diversity, um, which is actually in our framework um, in our mission statement. And we have a DEI club, which is the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Club. So it's a whole department um, who is just dedicated to making sure that our class, you know, has a lot of diversity every single year. And uh, we have two academic curriculum tracks, which is SGL and PBL, which we'll get into in the next slide, and then our state-of-the-art simulation center. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on our SGL and PBL because this is one of the main questions that we usually get from students. Um, so you would have to pick SGL uh, versus PBL um, in your secondary application. So to start, SGL is Synergist Guided Learning. So basically what most of you are probably all used to in your undergrad, it's traditional based learning, lecture style. Um, they, do so, they do do some case-based learning as well, uh, but it's mainly lecture style, uh, working with a class um, in a classroom setting. Um, their lectures are recorded through ECHO. So if um, they need any repetition, uh, they have that accessible to them. And then their quizzes, their exam and or quizzes would be every other Friday. So that's probably, you know, what you're used to right now. So we'll spend a little bit more time on PBL, which is different for most students. Uh, this is problem-based learning. So it's more independent study. You are learning from each other. So you're going through the organ blocks or all of the material um, through case studies. So it really gives our students an opportunity to start thinking clinically uh, from day one. So if you want more autonomy over your schedule, if you like smaller classroom settings, um, if you like to work more hands-on, uh, you learn by teaching others, this would be a great curriculum track for you. So just to give you a little rundown of kind of how their schedules would look. Um, so your case-based learning, your case groups would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday from around nine to 11.45. Um, every case group has around eight students, eight to 10 students. Uh, your first year, you will be going through the organ blocks with a PhD, and then your second year, you will be going through uh, the, the pathology part of your curriculum with a DO or a physician. Um, so you'll start your class with what's called an LI or a learning issue. So those are things that you choose to present to your class. So it'll be uh, six to eight small 10-minute presentations given by you and your classmates to go over the curriculum that you learned in the last, in what you're going over in the curriculum at that time. And then the rest of um, the class will be spent on going through those case studies, which would last one to three classes at a time, depending on how fast you go through them. Tuesdays, you learn with a doctor and you do your physical work or your physician implicit knowledge. And then Thursday is your osteopathic mani manipulation medicine lab uh, with your PBL cohort. Um, I also wanted to add in here, because this is another question that we usually get. If you do need any repetition or you don't quite understand something that's going on um, in that block, you do have the SGL lectures available to you at any time. And they, um, their exams scheduling, their exam schedules are set up a little bit differently. They have one exam per block. So however long it takes them to go through an organ block, that is when they will take their exam. So usually that's around uh, 46 weeks. All right, so another, um, Another aspect of Rowan Virtuous Psalm that sets us apart is our state-of-the-art simulation center. So uh, this makes us a leader in patient care. Um, it provides tactile, hands-on training for our students that they use 
uh, year one to year four. It was created and designed to complement skills that are currently currently being taught to students in their courses in clerkship. And at, at this time, there are three types of simulation used that we will get into. Uh, so the first, um, this is these are real pictures from our um, simulation center. So the first one is standardized patient encounters. Uh, so this is where you're going to get most of your experience working hands on with real people. So an actor or actress will come in complaining of a real, very common exam room complaint. So this is where you will figure out what's wrong with your patient. Um, really good experience in asking the correct questions, uh, you know, using the right communication styles and just learning um, patient care and bedside manner. This is also where you will learn your history and exam skills as well. Next is a procedural training. Uh, so here you'll be using partial mannequins mostly to learn specific skills uh, like IV placement, suturing, intubations. Um, uh, the more comfortable you are, you know, administering these skills, the more comfortable you are, you'll be comfortable with real patients. So this is kind of the background with this. And then last, we have our simulator cases, which exposes our students to clinical and situational scenarios. So this gives our students experience working with um, from acute all the way to life threatening care. And it also gives our students um, experience working in high pressure environments and then also working with a team as well. So like I said, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, our Center for Student Success. So it is an, an entire department here to help you succeed. They take a proactive versus reactive approach and they are designed or designated per personal advisor. So basically you get one advisor in pre-clerkship that will stay with you for your first two years of medical school. And then you get a different advisor that will stay with you uh, for your rotations. So this is like a mandatory advisor relationship that you'll have um, just to make sure that you're not just doing well in school, but you know, your mental health is in check. Um, and they don't just step in when they feel they have to, or you know, maybe you're not doing as well as you want to in a certain class, but they, they're always there to check up on you. Um, so other resources that are offered from our student first center, six, for students, center for student success is the academic advising and coaching, learning and test taking strategies, um, study skills, time management, board exam guidance and prep, career matching advising, and then that academic tutoring done by upperclassmen. All right, so I wanted to do a, a little breakdown on our goals and objectives. Um, so develop clinically skillful, compassionate, culturally competent physicians from diverse backgrounds who are grounded in our osteopathic philosophy and ready to meet future healthcare workforce needs. Advance research, innovation, and discovery to improve health and solve the medical challenges of today and the future, and then provide exceptional patient-centered care with an emphasis on primary and interprofessional team-based care that responds to the needs of the community, including the underserved and special needs population. So very wordy, I know. I wanted to just read that um, because we're going to be breaking it down in the next couple of slides. Um, so really just developing, we're just here uh, to produce a diverse student body who's committed to not only the mission of Rowan Virtuous Psalm School of Osteopathic Medicine, but also the values and principle of osteopathic medicine itself. And then advanced, like I said, we are a Carnegie R2, almost uh, Carnegie R3 Institute of Technology and Research. Um, so we take a lot of pride in our research commitment and then uh, provide. So we, at this time, uh, we have three student run initiatives um, that our students use to give back to our community. Um, uh, so the first one, is the RCHC, which is the Rowan Health Club. Uh, so this clinic is run entirely by student efforts and donation. Um, it provides a number of different services to our, our um, community that includes prescription programs, STD counseling, and osteopathic manipulation. Uh, second, we have our OMM clinic, which stands for Osteopathic Manipulation Medicine. This clinic spreads awareness on OM while specifically serving individuals who give back to our community. And then lastly, we have Rowan's Health, Healthy Lifestyle Club, which is my personal favorite because I have a background 
in um, health and wellness. And I understand how difficult it is for people to get their health under control without professional help. So that's exactly what this clinic does. It makes the process of getting healthier less overwhelming. And the services that are offered here are free consultations, follow-ups, and even uh, free web webinars to the community as well. All right, so just going to touch on this a little bit. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with where we're located in South Jersey, but we are about 30 miles away from Philadelphia, 30 minutes away from Philadelphia, uh, a less than a two hour commute to New York City, um, about an hour away from Delaware. So just in saying this, we're surrounded by some of the best medical facilities in the country. There are 43 teaching hospitals in New Jersey, 37 in New York City, six in Philadelphia. So it is a great place to live, learn, work, and play. And then Rowan Virtuous Psalms Campus Advantage. So like I said before, we have two, um, two campuses. One is in Stratford, one is in Sewell. They're about 20 minutes apart. Stratford is mainly where our SGL cohort will live. Um, but we do have a small co cohort of PBL as well. But our Sewell campus, that is our newer um, campus, that is all PBL students. So depending on what curriculum track you are most interested in, that is pretty much where you'll decide on campus. So both of those campuses have um, several internal sites. So it gives our students a lot of networking opportunities. And then this is where you'll be doing your pre-clerkship or your preceptorship during your pre-clerkship as well. So we have NMI. Uh, the Neuromuscular Institute, we have pediatrics, geriatrics, we have internal med, an OBGYN center, we have the RISEN Center, which is the center for um, special needs for adults, we have the CARES Institute for children, and then family medicine as well on both sites. And then quickly, I just wanted to get into early decision. So uh, the early decision program is really just designed for applicants that know for a fact that Rowan is their number one choice in a DO school. Um, and it is open to both in-state and out-of-state residents. Uh, so basically these are kind of the parameters you can look at um, to see if you are able to apply early. So if you have a GPA over 3.6, your over, over, overall MCAT score is a 503 or above and you meet all general application requirements that you can find on our website. And that also is kind of like a good um, summary of what we're looking for a competitive applicant as well. Um, obviously, health profession experience, research experience is always a plus, um, passion for uh, the osteopathic principles, um, and then obviously these grading metrics as well that are important. But uh, thank you for listening. Um, and then right, but right here under this arrow, I just put my name my email address, and then this is my work phone. If you guys wanna write that down, if you have any questions, please feel free. And if you visit our website under admissions, um, we have a link, there's a link under my name for, to um, schedule one-on-one -on -one consultations over WebEx as well. So if you have any advising questions, if you need any advice, uh, if anything comes up that you want to um, speak about in more in depth, then you can schedule that with me as well. Thank you. Thank you all for um, that information. And so um, we have reached the point where we can, um, anyone here, you can feel free. We are in an intimate environment for sure. So you can always unmute yourself and ask your question or place it in the chat. We did have some questions um, that were put inside. Um, I see that one was um, directly addressed. Okay, great. Um, there was another one that asked about um, the dual program, DO, MBA, are there extra costs concerning those dual programs? Yeah, with reference to our program, I just answered that. So there's a special okay. blended tuition rate for that. It's lower than the cost of both programs, but it is um, somewhat higher than just the DO only. And that would be the same for CCOM. We have a dual degree DO MPH. So there would be an added cost. 
Okay. Us, us as well. And it's a seven year program. I just wanted to add that seven year program. It's a two, three, two model. So you would do your first two years of medical school. Uh, you would go, your three would be your PhD. Then you'd go back for your rotation. So it's seven years. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more on my end. I don't know if anybody got um, direct questions on their end that they feel like everyone should hear. I do know we've gotten a lot of questions, um, particularly from students in the application cycle um, who are trying to make decisions about which schools they want to attend and the deposit. I know that they could range in cost and timing often impacts like having to um, essentially put down, are there any ways that these costs are, um, or students who experience challenges, economic challenges, are there any routes of communication they can use if they've gotten to that point where they're making decisions? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that first. Um, yeah, anybody who's admitted and is uh, having a challenge with paying their deposit, we have a $500 deposit. Um, yeah, just email our office and let us know. We'd be happy to work with you and um, yeah, figure out a path forward for that for sure. I, I don't want that to slow anyone down who really wants to come to Michigan State. Yeah, appreciate it. Any? Yeah, my answer is probably going to be very similar to that. It's the same. It's a $500 deposit. Um, if students are struggling with that, we get emails um, and then we just forward them to the dean. Sometimes she sets up, um, you know, short little webinar or I'm sorry, WebEx conversations with them to go over other options for them or anything, you know, that they could discuss. But sometimes it's um, it's solved and sometimes it's not. But yeah. Yeah. I would it. probably follow what Jenna just said, except our deposit is 200. It is partially refundable. Um, but if there are um, difficulties in meeting a deadline, I encourage students to reach out directly to our director of admissions. But you can certainly just reach out to the general admissions email. We would forward that email along to the appropriate individual for review. Okay. Um, I saw another one in the chat. It says, for all panelists, um, what are some things that make... Um, I guess their app like applications stronger. I don't know if they want to um, specify by what they mean by stronger. I know we we talk a lot about fit when it comes to applying to institutions. Um, I think it was you, Carrie, that kind of highlighted the community service um, and things like that. I guess if there are pillars of the program. Um, is is fit how should fit or distance traveled or things that help students bring their journey into context um how should they utilize those like the parts of the application to show that i'd say that in my time i've i've worked at both osteopathic and allopathic colleges i'd say that the, what i what i see in the applications that i look at every year at michigan state the biggest missed opportunity that is a consistently missed opportunity is applicants failing to articulate their alignment with osteopathic medicine in some way. You're going to fill out a separate application. So irrespective of whether you're applying to, you know, podiatry programs and allopathic programs and whatever else, you have a special opportunity in your Comus application to really identify something that resonates with you about any aspect of osteopathic medicine. You want to try to tie osteopathic principles and practice and the values of osteopathic medicine and the service focus of that and, and the way in which it's tied sometimes to primary care and the way in which this is a distinct professional pathway and osteopathic physicians see themselves as part of a unique community with a unique identity. You may or may not have had the opportunity to have a lot of engagement with osteopathic physicians. We understand that, mm -hmm. but you want to make sure that you've sort of done as much legwork as possible, and then do something in your ACOMAS application that really highlights the way that you've tried to learn about that. And I think that's the biggest missed opportunity is that it feels like somebody who may be a reasonably well-prepared applicant, but they have get that sense that they've just maybe copied some other assets over from something else, where if you can just add a little bit more specificity or a little bit more reflection, mm -hmm about your perspective and how you see yourself contributing, how you see yourself aligning, how you see yourself and your values being well aligned with this sort of osteopathic sense of being. 
that's incredibly valuable. Almost nobody does that. I'll be very mm -hmm. honest with you. Like almost nobody does that in their application. So if you do that, I know it sounds like the like the most ridiculous piece of advice I could possibly give you in a sense, but if you do it, it really does help your application, I think, to positively stand out in that way. So really using it as a unique opportunity to talk about osteopathic medicine and what you know and what excites you and that type of thing, that I think is really, really key. That can be in your personal statement, it can be in experiences, but whatever you can do to highlight those types of things, that'll resonate really, really well. So I really can't overemphasize that, I don't think. I second everything that Lyman says. Use that professional, that personal essay in the ACOMAS application to have something stand out. We don't have a, we will not have a secondary application next application cycle. We'll have some custom questions in ACOMAS that will be more directed at CCOM. But having that professional knowledge, just like Lyman said, you might not be able to find a DO to shadow, but you sure you should have an understanding of what it is mm -hmm. and be able to highlight that. So you said it perfectly, Lyman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um my always my biggest piece of advice when I talk to students that are um thinking about applying is just to tailor your application to the mission of Rowan. So why Rowan? Why osteopathic medicine? Why do you want to treat holistically? Um yeah, just kind of bringing like your personal statement alive in your application. That's always my biggest piece of advice and then professionalism always always um yeah, I mean, I think I think Liam pretty much he hit every point I was going to make on that one. So, um, that's great. Thank you. Do you does um the ACOM still have the choose choose DO like where you can get paired with a uh, DO in your area? Yeah, if they go to the website, yeah, you'll be able to put in your zip code, and they should have DOs within a radius. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we've definitely encouraged students to do the legwork of, you know, doing that. I know in Maryland, it's sometimes a little hard to find opportunities, but many of them are out of state and they can find these opportunities um, in the summers and things. So we encourage you to utilize tools like Choose, the, um, Choose DO. Um, there are forms that you can fill out to see if there are DOs in your area and find opportunities to do that as well, um, particularly for the question that was asking about the differences and the nuances. So I think it's important you shadow and um, learn. Um, there's tons of virtual shadowing opportunities I know have come out of COVID that um, have been really transformative in helping students learn as well. So we encourage you to do that. Um, I had a question sent to me that was asking about international students. Um, they know that someone covered it, but in terms of like admission processes and um, are there different, I guess, criteria or outcomes pertaining to sure. internet? Yeah, functionally speaking, we don't, at Michigan State, we don't treat out-of-state students really any differently than we would treat any uh, international students and out-of-state students are all just kind of grouped together. We don't really make a functional distinction between someone who's, um, yeah, out of state in, in contradistinction to internet, um, um, other out of state students. So largely, we're we're either kind of lumping you into the in state category or the out of state category. And there may be some other steps you may have to take as an international student in terms of some of the university things. But um, at, international students really aren't are uh, going through a unique process or any special disadvantage. Thank you. Um. And then there's one that says, we'll do one more. Um, what is something important about your respective school we cannot find online? I like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever that question before. <laughs> That's great. It's great. Yeah. Mm. I think um, for at least for Rowan, they do... Um, go over the two different per curriculum tracks, but I think um, that is an emphasis that we're trying to um, speak with students more in depth about. 
uh, so they really understand the difference between the PBL and the SGL curriculums. And for those, I always just advise students to either make a consult a one-on-one -on -one consultation with myself, my coworker, John, or the Dean of Admissions to really go over them to see what your learning style would be and what you would be most successful at, or even better, scheduling a shadow date mm -hmm. with a student. Uh, that we offer so you could really just spend the entire day uh, with a PBL or SGL or both um, if you have the time to do so um, and go in the classrooms with the students go through the lectures um, see if that's a good learning style for you and then also sitting in on a case study with the PBL cohort as well it's um, that's something that you know we touch upon and we're constantly talking about and explaining to students so I would say uh, we need to be more in depth about that on our website, of course, but I think that's something you really have to immerse yourself in and get firsthand experience with to really understand um, what would be the best for you because it's a it's a very, very important decision before starting your medical school career with Rowan. And I just I would piggyback off of that. I think making a visit to the institutions that you're applying to. Um, there's only so much we can put on the website videos and pictures, but being on campus, feeling the community, talking with current students, talking with your admissions reps, faculty even, will give you a better sense of where you see yourself. And so I think making those, those appointments, being active, um, if you can in your travel to visit those campuses, you can't put that on a website. You can't put that environment in that feel. Mm. Yeah, I think schools are pretty good about putting the relevant information online that you could actually consume or digest or 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 or, or leverage in some way. The experiential dimension is is what's missing. So yeah, I mean, visit a variety of of institutions um, that can just also just help you get a feel for the kinds of things that may emerge for you as important considerations. You want to be at a big school, at a small school, at a suburban school, at a rural school, at an urban place. Those th those kinds of things will help you sort out sort of contextually where you feel like you fit in really well. So that's helpful. Um, I in the last minute, I do get the question of in the future, will schools return to more in person interviews, or will they keep them online and do things more like second looks and things like that after admittance? But I guess. Um, just reiterating what options are in the stages of interviewing, um, just touching on that a little bit. Yeah, we have no plans to move away from virtual interviews, especially with the number of out-of-state students we want to bring in. We're really trying to reduce that cost um, to that point. So we'd really rather make an offer of admission and then invite you to come to visit the campus at that time. So that's the focus for us. We offer both. We have in-person and virtual. Yeah, right now we only have um, virtual. I think it's a lot more efficient for admissions staff. We get over 6,000 applications a year. Um, so it's it's a lot for our faculty. So for right now, it's just, um, it's just virtual, but I'm not sure what will come in the future. So we'll see. Okay. We are at the hour. Um, and so we will um, just thank you for your time again for coming and presenting to students and allowing us to record to share with those who were unable to make it. Um, for those students who have attended, I think they saw in the PowerPoint, hopefully you screenshot the information, but I will send an email after um, with the recording link, as well as any contact information that the panelists were um, provided. Just, so, yeah. I was just, I was writing my email in the chat actually right now, so. Okay, appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, and so we encourage those who are in their investigative stage to keep learning more about it um, if and seek out um, the offered help to um, through the process. Thank you again. Thank you all. It was nice Thank meeting you. you. Yeah, nice meeting you. you. See you guys. Bye. Bye.